at the core of it all is always human to human marketing, you know, H to H, not B to B and B to C. Okay, welcome back to the Marketing Playbook presented by Details Interactive. Here, you'll take away three game-winning marketing plays every episode to take back to your team. I'm your host, Mark Friedman, and my career has been focused on direct-to-consumer marketing, direct mail, physical retail, and digital commerce. This is episode number 42, and today's guest is Jeffrey Slater, the Chief Listening Officer at the Marketing Sage Consultancy. Before we get started, a quick thank you, as always, to Max Brandstetter of the Wild Business Growth Podcast for producing this episode. You can reach him at max at maxpodcasting.com to help bring your podcast to life. Let's open the playbook. Ready, break. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Marketing Playbook Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Jeffrey Slater, the Chief Listening Officer for the Marketing Sage Consultancy. A little bit about Jeff. From 1975 to 1989, he and his wife built Rachel's Brownies, a wholesale bakery business selling millions of brownies. They got to partner with Ben and Jerry and have lunch with President Reagan when he celebrated small businesses in Malvern, Pennsylvania. Inc. Magazine named their business one of the fastest growing companies in 1985. In 1989, Jeff and his wife successfully sold their multi-million dollar company to Goodmark Foods, a Raleigh, North Carolina business. After the sale, Jeff was involved with a number of notable brands, Slim Jims and David's Sunflower Seeds, to name a few. He also spent eight years as the global marketing leader for Nomacork, a wine closure company closing billions of wine bottles, now called Vinventions. Today, Jeff runs a fractional CMO consultancy called the Marketing Sage for small to mid-sized companies who want a strategic marketing leader who listens, plans, acts, and measures. Jeff helps unravel the mysteries of marketing as he sells seasoned advice. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Mark. I'm really thrilled to be here with you. Well, thanks very much. I, I feel like uh, I know you so well, although we've never met, but I am you know, very good friends with your brother, Mitch. Uh, he and I live in the same town in, in Westfield, New Jersey. Um, I also know your mom, B, Queen B, and, and we'll talk a little bit about her and how she's inspired you and the work that you do. Uh, and I also know of your daughter, Fanny, who many might know uh, is a, uh, a star on the Food Network. She's done you know, a bunch of different shows, and she also was on a podcast with your brother, Mitch. Uh, that entire show, as I was listening to her story, I, I was walking uh, on my, my daily walk and, and uh, listening. I, I was smiling from ear to ear because uh, it was really a great story of how uh, she got to be on the Food Network and how your mom was involved with that. So lots of connections to you. So uh, welcome and, and thanks for joining the show. So let's just briefly talk about your mom, B. She's an inspiration to lots of people. Talk a little bit how she's inspired you um, throughout your career and, and perhaps in some of the things you're doing today. Well, you know, you mentioned our uh, bakery business. My mom and her close best friend, Norma, became distributors of our brownie in North Jersey. And she would take the brownies to places like the Milburn Deli and Kings and deliver the brownies. And, you know, she was the absolute best distributor we could possibly have. She'd go into a store and tell stories about her son and daughter-in-law and her grandchildren. <laughs> It, it, was, it wasn't scalable, of course, but it was the best thing in the world. Uh, but she's always been an inspiration to me, centered around family, uh, centered around her children, her grandchildren, now her great-grandchildren. And uh, you mentioned about uh, our younger daughter, Fanny. When Fanny was, um, I guess it was about five years ago, she got a text from my mom. My mom uses an iPhone sent a text and said, Fanny, I'm watching Rachel Ray, and you won't believe this, but they're having a competition to get a cookbook published. And Fanny was very interested in cooking, not professionally trained. And my mom sent a text to her and said, hey, you never know. 
and I think those are the watchwords of, uh, you know, that's guided us is my mother's encouragement to say, go take a shot, you know, take a shot at it. You never know. And of course, Fatty went on to win the competition and to get a book deal with Simon and Schuster and Rachel Ray's publishing house and on TV, et cetera. But uh, mom and our dad were both just inspirations. And when my dad passed back 2009, um, you know, we never knew what to expect our mom's life would be like, and she continues to impress us every day. You know, when I get a text from her that says, hey, I can't get my Instagram account to work, <laughs> or I can't, I can't, you know, I'm Googling, I'm Googling this movie and I can't find the results. Can you help me? It just keeps me young. Well, she and I have a a great love for the New York Mets, and and as we were talking, that's uh, not a good story right now. Um, I've actually been at games uh, with her, World Series games uh, with her and, and Mitch, and we also have this uh, somewhat annual ritual uh, the last few years. Mitch and I have birthdays that are only a few days apart, and, and we've spent uh, some dinners with your mom and, and Mitch and Leslie and my wife, Debbie. Uh, and it's always been a, a lot of fun. So uh, she's a great lady. Let's go back to to you and and your career. Lots of, you know, product related marketing. Why don't you uh, help the audience take us up to quickly a, a, a run up of Rachel's Brownies and how that became a thing and ultimately what happened to that business through the sale. Um, so my wife started the business around seventy five. And when I met her a little later in the year and then maybe in, into the next year, we started dating. Um, I started to help her with the business. Uh, I was in graduate school. I had a commercial photography business at the time while I was in school uh, doing children's portraits and commercial studio work. We built the business together slowly. We, uh, we, were, we never took investment. We knew nothing about business. Um, I had a passion around food and cooking, and the product was just an exceptional pop product. It was originally inspired by a Temple cookbook recipe, and we built the business based on purely trying to make the most exceptional, remarkable product and focused on quality and service and customer experience with that product. We built it throughout our own distribution in uh, Philadelphia, where we lived at the time, you know, in our own little vehicle and would go from store to store delivering the brownies and then going home and making the brownies. It grew slowly year after year. Um, we expanded into other markets, working with distributors who typically sold uh, haagen ice cream. So frozen food distributors would carry it. They'd get the product, had no preservatives, freeze it, then sell it into stores you know we expanded into uh, from specialty stores to convenience to grocery to food service people who remember people express airlines they used to sell the brownies on board and united served that millions of them for years and then around 1989 we sold the business to uh, a raleigh north carolina company called good mark foods they had a portfolio of brands they had some bakery businesses they bought the business and I just thought that was the end of it and I'd go do something else. But they wanted me to continue with the business to sort of bring a little bit of entrepreneurial spirit into their company. It was a great opportunity. I worked with the brownie business for a few more years. It got merged into some other bakery businesses. Sadly, the business doesn't exist anymore, as happens with a lot of brands. Um, as the company sold the baking business off and then the people who bought it sort of made a mess of things. But, you know, we owned it, we nurtured it, we took care of it when it was ours. But when we sold it, we understood you have to let it go. And fortunately, I got to um, grow into some other huge brands that were $100 million plus brands. And eventually I was the EVP of marketing for and a member of the executive team and worked on uh, growing the portfolio. We, over the time I worked on the bigger business, we doubled the sales in about four or five years and tripled the profits. And it became very attractive and Conagra Foods purchased the business and uh, went to work for them for several years, continuing in the snack food side of things. And you know, I was very fortunate to work on an iconic American brand called Slim Jims. 
is ironic because I don't eat meat. <laughs> I'm not a particular fan of the product, but I understood the essence of the brand. And fortunately, we had the wherewithal to be able to invest in consumer marketing, advertising, events, sponsorships. I got to work very closely with the professional wrestler, macho man, Randy Savage. In fact, I taught him how to use email. I remember <laughs> setting up his AOL account, pafor at aol.com. Pafo was his real last name. Uh, sadly, Randy passed away a few years ago, but it was an unbelievable experience. And he was the personification of the brand come to life. And it was such an incredibly valuable experience to work with him and to learn how to market with a celebrity. And it was just great fun, great fun. And I, you know, I look back on those days so fondly and I write about them all the time on my blog, just so many memories. You talk about um, being acquired, you know, entrepreneur being acquired, now coming into a, an entirely different environment that's much more corporate, uh, although they, you know, oftentimes big companies say they want that entrepreneurship. Uh, their culture doesn't always uh, support that. Uh, it seems like it did support that because you stuck with it for quite some time. Yeah, you know, I, I was surrounded by a team, a marketing team uh, with incredibly smart MBAs. I didn't have an MBA. I had a master's in communication from the Annenberg School at Penn, but I really had never studied business, much to my dad's chagrin. I just didn't really have a great interest in it, but I was able to learn how to mentor and work with my team members and colleagues um, to learn the importance of collaborating with sales, to work very closely with finance to make sure they understood what we were doing, how we were measuring success. I looked at it as uh, it's just an incredible learning environment, a chance for me to learn and try all kinds of new things. Um, and uh, fortunately, the, uh, the founder and CEO of the company had great confidence in me and the team. Um, and you know, I'm just internal, eternally grateful for all of that and for the, uh, the experiences that it, uh, you know, afforded me over that uh, 13, 14 year run with the company. That's a long run. Uh, that's outstanding. You know, we do have, uh, you know, kind of an, a wide array of people that listen to the show, some more senior, some more junior. Uh, I've done a lot of interviewing of folks that are early stage companies and, and might find themselves in a similar situation where they want to sell out and, and have an exit. What's the one piece of advice, you know, you, you talk about letting go. What's that one piece of advice you might give people that are considering selling? You know, it, it's, it's a little different for everybody, of course, but I'm just a very curious person and want to keep learning. And so I always look at it as, you know, what's the next chapter going to give me as an opportunity to learn something new? So I didn't look at it. I wasn't looking in the rearview mirror. I was looking forward and saying through the windshield, so to speak, uh, what's out there? What else can I do? What else can I learn? And I think that's kind of been a watchword for my career. You know, I got the opportunity to work in B2B companies, worked with um, a wine closure company that was a global marketing opportunity, which I hadn't done. Um, I did that for eight years. Uh, that was a company called Noma Cork, now called Inventions. And the opportunity there was to be able to learn how to market in other places around the world and understand how to um, create events and do public relations and conferences and all sorts of things that you know were totally new to me. At the core of it all is always human to human marketing, you know, H to H, not B to B and B to C. You know, I think about human to human marketing. You're trying to be helpful to somebody and share ideas and help them uh, solve their problems. And in the court business, uh, in what we did, that's exactly what we were able to do. And we closed one out of every seven bottles of wine in the world, which is billions and billions of corks. So it's quite an experience. 
And, and that product was sold uh, through retail, I'm guessing direct to consumer your own, or was that a little earlier than, the, than selling direct to consumer on the web? The, the cork business was selling directly to wineries um, and occasionally through distributors who would sell to wineries. So as an example, in the United States, there's about 10,000 wineries. In France and Italy, there's probably 100,000 wineries because there's so many small ones. It's a very different market. It's extremely fragmented in Europe and more consolidated in the US. You know, 10 companies in the US make up probably 85, 80% maybe of all the wine volume. You know, we had the experience and the challenge. We knew a lot of technical people in the wine industry, but we didn't know marketing people. And so when we had that challenge, um, I, along with my team, came up with a concept called the Wine Marketing Exchange, where we would have conferences, non-commercial conferences, educational conferences for wine marketers. And it was a chance for us to spend an entire day with senior wine marketing professionals and to bring really, really interesting speakers, people from places like IDEO and uh, Method and LinkedIn and people from Whole Foods and just all of these fascinating people to talk about their perspective on the wine industry, either as an insider or as an outsider. And then we took these events uh, globally and we did them in Italy and France and other places in Europe and Germany. Um, and they were enormously successful and continue today to uh, you know, my great happiness to know that those live on. Do you have a direct-to-consumer business? I enjoy connecting with guests on this podcast because it reminds me what I love to do, strategic and tactical consulting for businesses like yours. If you'd like to speak with me about your business and see how you can add a fresh set of eyes to your team, contact me at mark at detailsinteractive.com. Now let's get back to the marketing playbook. You've had this uh, career entrepreneurship, working in big companies, um, having some really good brands to be, you know, part of, and then you decide going to consult. How did that come about? Um, and as you started to think about where your capabilities were, what you could bring to potential clients, how did you shape what the uh, marketing sage became? You know, I think I always had a passion around being a mentor and a helper. About five years ago, I decided you know, I really wanted to do some new things. I wanted that next phase. I had worked in the wine, uh, for the, this wine company for about eight years. And I wanted to see what else I could do um, around consulting. So I opened up the Marketing Sage as a fractional CMO business where companies needed somebody with my level of expertise and experience, but couldn't afford me full time but needed maybe 20 hours, 30 hours a month of guidance. And so this fractional role and model um, became very attractive to a lot of the companies that I started to work from, uh, work with. So that included people who were in B2B and B2C, um, startups, uh, companies that were a couple hundred million dollars, companies that were a few million, nonprofits, it was just a range of companies. Um, and I think the, the big lesson for me was so many companies don't understand what marketing is. You know, they think, well, marketing is advertising. It's not. They, and they just don't understand it, but they know they need help with marketing. And so when I come in, um, I try not to speak marketing. I try to speak in language that means something to them. So I don't talk about inbound and outbound marketing. You know, I talk about people coming to your website or email marketing to reach and tell your story to customers. I've been, I think I've been successful because, you know, I've worked really hard at trying to be as helpful as I can and to listen carefully to the problems that these companies are trying to solve for and then to come up with tactical solutions to do that. So very strategic, but then I work on tactical projects, um, either myself or with partners, agencies, freelancers, contractors, individuals who can assist me 
Um, so it's, you know, I'm an agency without having any staff. And as I need people, I bring them in. It's, it's sort of like what some people call the Hollywood model of how a movie is made. You know, you assemble hundreds of people for six months to work on a project and then they all go away. And I really love that model because each one needs different input, different team members, and different kinds of guidance. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because, you know, as a sole practitioner, uh, lots of folks, you know, have that challenge of, you know, being the person that's going out and marketing themselves, then doing the work and servicing the clients and then doing the billing and, you know, being that chief cook and, and bottle washer, uh, it becomes, you know, very difficult to do. And it's also hard to scale. Uh, so it seems like being fractional and, and also assembling these team, uh, other people for your team uh, has helped you to uh, to build your business. That's that's really interesting. So when somebody you know comes to you, it it, it feels like each engagement is almost different, right? You're you're starting over uh, each time. You've got your your core knowledge, but uh, each one requires a little bit of a different nuance. I imagine. Uh, absolutely. I mean, every engagement is a bespoke arrangement. Um, I'm always very open and direct to share that I may bring people in to help based on the specific needs at hand. I also strive towards focus and simplicity in everything that I'm doing. Do my best to make sure that everybody is on the same page and we're clear about communication. You know, people talk about the importance of communication. And I think the thing that people miss is it's not about the talking, it's about the listening and the receiving of the message. So I will do a lot of work up front to make sure I can understand their pain points and their needs. I can put it in a one page document and ask them to read it and say, do I under is this understanding correct? What am I missing? What's not clear? And I don't like to get started on a lot of projects until I've got that beginning document that says, here's my understanding of the problem you're facing. And here are um, the different levers that you've identified that could be moved or pushed. Here are some of my thoughts. It's not really a tactical document. It's a very strategic document. Of, uh, it's really an understanding document to make sure that we both have the same common understanding of what we're going to start out to do together. Is there something recently, a particular project that you worked on that, you know, the outcome was one that you were, I'm sure you're proud of all the outcomes, but, you know, one that stood out to you uh, where you really feel like the work that you did uh, moved the needle for the client? I was part of um, a team. In fact, one of, the, one of the additional ways that I work is other consulting agencies or marketing agencies will bring me in to be a partner on a project. And so I was brought in to work on a project with a, with a couple other people. I was the marketing guy for it, and there was a sales guy who was involved. And this was a couple hundred million dollar company, and they needed help because they really had no demand generation plan in place, nothing repeatable and predictable. They had no outbound marketing, meaning they weren't telling their story and communicating regularly and effectively both to existing customers as well as prospects and leads. And so I built a, um, a game plan for them, a really elaborate blueprint of how to go to market. We finished the project and then several months, uh, maybe it was a month later or two months later, they were acquired by a billion dollar company. Um, and when I followed back up with them just a few months ago, I was thrilled to learn that they were using our blueprint and that that plan was going to be the guideline because it, no diff they now had more resources to put it in place, but they had the outline of what they needed. I, I, I think that's, that's always very satisfying you know, when that happens. But, you know, I think it's in the, I think it's in the day to day conversations with clients to be able to see something in it with a fresh pair of eyes counterintuitively, you know, not to necessarily see it and accept, you know, what 
the category may suggest is the way you approach something, but to see it with, um, you know, bringing in experiences from other industries and other, other verticals that I've worked in. I love the challenge of getting to name products and brands. I do a lot of naming work. Recently, a company called me in to do some work uh, on a healthcare company, and I was really excited to do that, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, another private equity firm <laughs> reached out to me and asked me to help them name a division for a food company that they were, they were putting together a portfolio of brands. The assignment was they needed the work done over the weekend. <laughs> they, they gave me three days to come up with an idea or several ideas, and I just loved that challenge because there's something about constraints that I think draws out my own uh, creativity and capability. Um, and I really love that framework, thinking about cre being creative through the constraints. Doing a, a name for pharmaceutical business or, you know, healthcare, that must be interesting. You put a bunch of letters together and whatever comes up, you know, you can kind of play Scrabble, <laughs> put the name out there, right? Yeah. And then of course, you know, you're, you're checking the USPTO to make sure that, you know, no one owns that mark or not in right. the category. And, uh, you know, URL availability and all of that. And, you know, does the word, you know, mean something uh, in a language that you're not aware of, right? <laughs> like, I think the, the classic was, and I owned a Chevy Nova, and Nova, Nova in Spanish means doesn't go. And that defined <laughs> my Chevy Nova, <laughs> which to this day, oh, I can still see that brown hatchback. Chevy Nova that after 30,000 miles, the aluminum motor froze up. <laughs> it was a, that was a mess. <laughs> Funny. You, uh, your, your website, uh, I, I think, does a great job at bringing to life uh, the work that you do. You're very multimedia focused. Um, you produce a, a blog. Uh, I don't know. How often do you send out that blog? Yeah, so, so I write a blog three times a week. Um, and, and the blog is usually in response to something I'll come across during the week or weeks in a conversation, but not necessarily a business conversation. Sometimes it's my mom, you know, will share a story, but I'm always looking for the ability to be a teacher and have a marketing message and a lesson in those stories. And I've been writing now, I've done about 14, 1500 blog posts, and I and I really wanted to get to become, I wanted to be a better writer. I, I always admired uh, my aunt Annette, who was this exceptional writer, lyricist. Uh, and I think I was a bit intimidated by her ability with the written word. And after she passed, I felt like, you know, I really want to dedicate myself to being a better writer. And so the best way to do that is to write a lot. It helps me also to think through you know, a marketing challenge, you know, what do I think about this? Or what do I know about this? Or, you know, I'll come across something new, particularly around technology and digital things that may be new to me. And I'll do some research and then I'll share, you know, a little bit about what I learned in a post. I, I follow your blog because I, uh, as, as to your point, I, I always feel like uh, I have something to learn. Uh, there were a few recently that, you know, really stuck out. Uh, well, one was about, do you pronounce it the pummy? Yeah, I think it's an abbreviation or a, a, for the word pumice. It's a short right. version. Yeah, my, my mom, the, the woman who cleans for her during the summer, her name is Bernadette, had helped my mom eliminate the ring in one of her toilet bowls. And she told me the story and I said, geez, you know, I need to clean a toilet bowl too. And, you know, long story short, I start writing this blog post about this product which is solely positioned as the way to clean the ring around a toilet bowl. It, the story that I tell in the blog illustrates how important it is to stand for something singular in the mind of a consumer so that they know what your purpose is. And when I occasionally will teach classes uh, to entrepreneurs or do consulting sessions with them or sometimes speak at universities, um, this will come up and I'll talk about, you know, what's the purpose of your brand? What, you know, what problem does it solve? And if you can't explain it to me, like I'm a six-year-old, it's just not going to work. 
it, you have to have a clarity around that. So stories like that uh, become useful uh, instruments to, or vehicles, I should say, to really be able to help people, you know, understand a really critical idea about marketing. One of the other ones uh, that really resonated recently, because it's something that, you know, I try to talk to people uh, that work with me. Um, it was entitled, well, I don't know if it was the title, but the focus was, do you keep a not to do list? I, I think we all tend to fall into traps of doing same old, same old each day. And there's likely things that we're doing. They're not as productive as either they once were, or they, maybe they never were productive. So talk about, you know, what's on the not to do list. Yeah, the not to do list is a reminder of some of the important lessons I've learned um, in marketing, mostly in the, through my career. Um, I mean, one that comes to mind is, when I meet with clients, I try not to speak as more than them. I try to ask questions. I try to listen. I try to get clarification. But unless I really need to talk a lot to explain something, I try to keep quiet because my purpose there is to be helpful to them. And I can be more helpful by, by listening than I can by talking. So these, this list that I keep, you know, sort of like your to-do list is a reminder of things you want to do. Often my list, my not to-do list is just a reminder of things that, you know, I don't want to do. Like, don't make this any more complicated. Don't involve more people. You know, sometimes in an effort to collaborate, I'll bring too many people into things. So it just reminds me of some of the things that I've learned along the way and that can be helpful. You know, uh, another one of them is a reminder not to speak marketing with most clients. And what I mean by that is this idea of, you know, using the industry language, B2B, B2C, inbound, outbound, or, you know, SEO, all the things that we know about as marketers. I, I try to avoid using that language and try to keep it as if I'm and this is not to be patronizing, but I just want it to be a simple and clear message that's understood. And if somebody doesn't understand, you know, GTM and go to market, well, maybe I can say, you know, what are the ways we're going to sell this? Who are we going to sell to and through to get to our end consumer who's going to buy the product? Um, so it's, it's, this list is really a reminder for me of best practices or bad practices. <laughs> you, you, uh, you talk about mentoring and obviously something that's important to me as, as well. Uh, one of your other blogs uh, talked about mentor managers. Uh, you describe four different kinds of managers, the removed manager, the buddy, the controller, and the mentor. Talk a little bit about that and, and, and maybe you know, also where the, uh, the thoughts for that uh, emanated from to write that blog. So I listened to a podcast by a guy named Mitch Joel uh, every Sunday. Uh, Mitch had a really great agency in Canada, has written several marketing books. And I started listening to him many years ago. And he is just a fantastic interviewer. And he always has great guests, a lot of authors and interesting people. And he had a guest on who just recently wrote a book called I Love It Here. His name is Clint Pulver. And the book spoke to uh, Clint's ability to go undercover, like he calls himself the undercover millennial. He would go into companies and ask them questions about what it's like working at different places and doing really like thousands of these over many years, he, he started to see this pattern. And what he found was that only mentor managers were the types of people that kept people at the company. You know, people stayed and loved working for a company, not because of the company, but because of their boss. And as he dug deeper into it, it was always this mentor manager who was there to help and guide, you know, be structured and disciplined, but also to be empathetic and connected to the individual so that they could be helpful. You know, and I think there's just so much wisdom in companies who are trying to 
bring on not just millennials, but any type of employee? You know, what do they need? What do they want? What's important to them? You know, I always had the habit of uh, once a year talking to everybody who worked on my team and asked them, have they looked for a job recently? Have they explored other opportunities? Is this still the right work for you? And it's not to discourage them or to ask them to leave, but it was to help them in their career to make sure that, you know, some companies, you know, you run into a level that you're going to be five years in this role. And if you want to move forward, you need help. So, you know, I, I, it really resonated with me, this idea of mentor manager, mentor manager. Um, and it's come up in a lot of discussions with several of my clients. So, you know, I felt sharing it on a blog post was a way of um, getting that story out there and, you know, raising the discussion. And then when I post it on LinkedIn, you know, I get tremendous conversation from people who comment and whether it's people in HR or people who are, um, you know, in different levels of organizations who share their perspective. Well, the stuff that you write, I have to admit, and hopefully uh, folks that are listening will uh, will sign up. And, and when we get to the end, you'll talk to, you'll tell us how uh, they can get your blog, but really insightful, uh, lots of things to, uh, to think about. So great job. Uh, so before we uh, get to the end here, I guess I have to ask you this one question that I got put up to uh, something about Camp Winnedu, a production of Wizard of Oz and, and your role. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mitch. <laughs> uh, so the year is 1966. I'm about 12 years old. I was a really good athlete, you know, had a lot of friends at camp, and the camp decided to put on a production of The Wizard of Oz. And uh, one of the counselors came to me and said, Jeff, we think you're the only one who could play Dorothy because no, no one's going to make fun of you. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's my brother, Mitch, who is the actor who loves to be in front of an audience, who is really, you know, when he was in, I think, since he was in kindergarten through today, you know, won't pass up on an opportunity to sing and dance uh, and, and be on stage. But I got the honor of being Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz uh, <laughs> at summer camp, and my Somewhere over the rainbow was pretty good, actually. I must say, <laughs> we're not we're not going to ask you to reprise that. Oh, thank you so much. But you know, I was just saying to my wife the other day. I remember how I had to learn these lines, and the camp was situated on a lake, and I would go out on a rowboat with the script, so I would be out there alone to learn it, and I hated it. I hated I hated the memorization and all of that. I had. You no, know, I did it. It was fun at the time, but I uh, quickly passed the baton to Mitch, all of his musical talents. To yeah, take he, over. he does. He, he does. Good stuff. So as we uh, get to the end of the show, we do this two minute drill. I'll give you a question. One or two word answers. Uh, love to hear your thoughts. OK, you bet. All right. A brand that you admire or that inspires you. Well, the brand is Ella Fitzgerald. Um, I have been a lifelong fan of her music, uh, and I just love her personal brand and her personality. It's something that lives with me all the time. I listen to her regularly and frequently. Is it live or is it Memorex? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right, so there's something that uh, stuck out uh, and stayed in my head as you were talking about Ella you Fitzgerald. Bet. Yeah, right? yeah, the Memorex ad. The favorite app on your phone? Well, that's easy. Uh, it's an app called Chatbook. And when I was a kid, um, our, grand, our maternal grandfather, George, made photo albums for all his grandchildren and then his great-grandchildren. I have a grandson, Bodhi Kai, who lives in Hawaii. And when my daughter sends pictures, I can use this app to make photo albums very easily and they get sent to her. And I just, I love it. I absolutely love using it. Uh, last website other than Amazon that you shopped from? Um, I bought stuffed cabbage for my mother for Mother's Day through Goldbelly, the uh, company, food company that is a sort of an aggregator of different ability to ship product all over. And I think that's the last one that I bought from. One of my, well, stuffed cabbage, one of my favorites. That's good. Uh, something that you're not good at, but that you wish that you were. 
Um, I'd say financial analysis. You know, I took some classes uh, in business and finance, but I never really got deep, deeply into it. And I wish I had a, a deeper and better understanding of uh, that subject. Charitable organization that you're passionate about. Um, for several years, I was a uh, head of the marketing department for a nonprofit called Safe Child that focused on the county that I lived in. I live in now Wake County uh, to help with programs around children who have been abused. So real passion around that space. Okay. If you had one superpower, what would it be? Time travel. I would love, love to go back and meet my father and my grandfathers at different ages. And I'd love to go forward and meet my grandson as a grandfather. Uh, I just fascinated with the idea of bending time. I like that one. And other than family, what's your most prized possession? I'd have to say it's the photo albums that my grandfather made for me. Uh, my brother and sister and I look at them, our albums all the time. And you know, they're a constant source of joy and pleasure and connection and emotion and uh, just invaluable to me. That's nice. I've seen a lot of pictures uh, over the years that, uh, that your brother has, uh, has posted and all, and it's re really nice memories. Good answers. Thanks very much for that. Jeff, uh, tell us, uh, tell the listeners where they can reach you on social media. You know, the easiest place to find everything is at the marketingsage.com and you can see connections there to everything you can sign up for free for my blog you know i'm very active on linkedin uh, i'm at moments later that's m-o-m-e-n-t-s underscore later uh, on twitter and instagram but i'd say mo i spend most of my time on linkedin that's probably the place i, I get the most most uh engagement and pleasure at, at a sharing and let's learning and connecting with people. Thank you for that. Uh, really good session. Thanks for spending the time today. Your interesting uh, experiences that you've had and the work that you're doing today at the Marketing Sage uh, also uh, uh, really helpful to, you know, even people that have been in their careers for, for quite some time. I always pick up something new. So um, have a great day. Uh, enjoy the rest of the summer. And uh, hopefully one of these days I'll see you here in New Jersey. You bet. Thanks for inviting me on the show, Mark. I'm a big fan. I love listening to your podcast and I'm always learning from your guests. So thanks for inviting me. That's it. Today's game ball goes to Jeffrey Slater for coming on the Marketing Playbook. To me, today's three game-winning marketing plays were as follows. Number one, you just never know. You heard Jeffrey speak about his daughter, Fanny, and her winning a contest on the Food Network. She was notified about this contest by her grandmother who told her, you just never know. Take your shot, be bold, be aggressive, and make good things happen for yourself. Number two, you can remake yourself. I started my career as an auditor in an accounting firm, and fortunately, I went to work for a client who then moved me into marketing, and I never looked back. Where you start is not always where you end up. And number three, we heard about the do not do list, which I absolutely love. We all tend to fall into the trap of doing things daily out of habit and not necessity. Periodically, you should evaluate the time spent each day at work and be sure that each of those tasks is truly productive. If not, find other things to do with that time. Thank you, Playbook Marketers, for listening to another episode. If you want to check out more pages of the Marketing Playbook, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast spot and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Details Interact and learn more at detailsinteractive.com. Until next time, the devil is in the details.